Big Transaction in Local Media. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. So I've, uh, I don't know, coined the phrase, the Bible of Northern Rhode Island, uh, when I referred to the Valley Breeze. It's just something I, I mentioned, I don't know, 15 years ago. I was just so impressed when I first moved in nearly 20 years now uh, into the state that there was a, a local newspaper that really dug into the community. Then, well, as I was a, a newcomer to Rhode Island in Cumberland, uh, the paper was focused mostly on Cumberland and Lincoln. Uh, it has sin grown, since grown to really kind of dominate the whole northern region. And as a weekly, it is really the pulse uh, of the community, and it has been sold. And so the Valley Breeze uh, will be in the hands, is now in the hands of, of a new owner, and it's Creator, former owner, publisher Tom Ward is here to tell the story. Great to have you aboard. If you're watching this show originally on June 12th, uh, on this particular day, we got more shenanigans and stuff going on at the State House uh, with abortion uh, battles and uh, the DCYF investigation and a whole sorts of things which normally and sundrily I would have commentary on. But I'm going to save all of that for tonight because if you're seeing this a second time, you know that this is a conversation that is. Uh, not time sensitive, and I, I, I want to go in depth with Tom. So there you go. Uh, here's a headline The Valley Breeze announces that it's changing hands. Uh, always kind of a subtle thing to handle within your own news organization, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you just, we're selling! That's, you know, it's kind of like, you know, yeah, quiet, yeah, yeah. easy, uh, because I think a lot of people are probably like, oh, no because they don't know the details. And I think it was important after our radio conversation last week to bring you on and let you uh, tell the story. Congratulations, because I know Thank that's you. in order, right? Thank you. Yes, and, it is. And you feel really good about it. I do. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to be slowly, gradually moving toward retirement with my beautiful wife, Carol, and our grandkids, our kids, and now our grandkids. And <clears throat> it's, been, uh, it's been a great ride, and I've been blessed beyond what I ever expected to happen. Uh, but here we are, and suddenly, <coughs> excuse me, suddenly you get older, and you're 65 and 66, and it's like, geez, and you, you, you have friends, and they're all retired, and you say, well, you know, nobody, it, it occurred to me, nobody's going to come along and give me a gold watch and say, time to go home. So you have to figure out a different exit plan. Mm. So it, it took a little time, but uh, here we are. All right, so what, why don't we talk about this in parts? First, I think the story of how the paper began is, is, is incredibly relevant, and then we'll talk about the transaction and then the nature of the business uh, as you see it. Uh, once upon a time, you were working for the Woonsocket Call at yeah. all, and you said, hmm, what? Yeah, well, 77 to 85, I was a photographer, photojournalist, and then an editor at the Woonsocket Call. Then I went to Fall River, actually, for five years um, because I had, I had been in management at the Call and it was taking up more and more and more hours as time went on, and, and at that point I was um, I had my three young daughters being born, and, and uh, it became a little bit untenable. Uh, my wife is a nurse, and so she could flex her hours a bit. Uh, and so uh, I went to Fall River, and I went there for five years, and it was a wonderful five years in, at the floor of the Herald News, um, but mostly because it was a 40-hour work week, and, and I could live a little bit better a life with my daughters and, and uh, my wife at that time. But it was during that time that I recognized that something was really beginning to change with my former employer, the call. You know, I could see the numbers really starting to get hurt, especially in Cumberland Lincoln. And what happened, I lived in Cumberland, and still live in Cumberland, and what happened was um, you could see the numbers for the call and the times both diminishing pretty greatly during that time in the early 1990s. At the same time as Steve Jobs and Wozniak and all these guys came along and invented this little machine that allowed people like me, frankly poor people like me, to learn desktop publishing and start a newspaper. And that really was a huge change in society. The desktop publishing got to a point where people like me could start a paper. Um, in Fall River, I met a young man named Jamie Quinn, uh, who's from Lakeville, Mass. And Jamie was 
it, you know, people were still waxing ads onto pages and stuff, and you know, all the old guys were. And Jamie was the guy sitting at the computer doing all ads um, on a computer, which was a new thing back then. And and so, you know, I spoke to him and I said, look, I, I have this idea. The diminishment of the call in the Times in Cumberland Lincoln, Cumberland, his two towns that were growing, that were vital, that had really, uh, you know, big numbers of people. Um, you knew that I just I, felt, I sensed there was an opening, and so I started to talk to business people and say, "Look, if I ever did this, what do you think?" And they were like, "Oh, please do it." And and so, it really um, so in March, uh, you know, I left in February of 1996, and a month we printed a prototype, had about 500 copies, and went out to people and said, "We're thinking of doing this here in town. Would you like to buy ads?" And a lot of people started right out of the box that say, you know what, we're going to give you a chance, or we like the idea, we want to see this through. And so um, at the same time, about a month earlier, I asked Marsha Green, who at that time had left the Pawtucket Times as their city editor. Marsha also lived in Cumberland. And I said, look, I, I have this idea. She and I didn't know each other very well. We knew each other very little bit by reputation. Um, but she said, she said, sure, I'll give it, I'll give it a whirl. You know, I said the pay is going to be low for everybody at the beginning. We're just going to see if this gets off the ground, uh, and it did, um, thankfully. And um, it was off to the races, and we never looked back. Why, why did the call in the Times find uh, it tough to do business? I know we have newspaper trends, daily newspaper trends that have now, what, two, three decades long. But why, why did that, why did that project <coughs> diminish, but your project? was poised to seize the moment and flourish. What was, what, what was the juxtaposition there, do you think? I, I can't be sure, but I, but I know, uh, well, first of all, Journal Register Company had come in and bought the Winsaka Call, and, and it had gone from family hands to, to this big Wall Street company. Um, at the time, I said naively, but uh, you know, I think it was pretty smart. I said, after about five years, I said, you know what? Wall Street really doesn't belong in this business. They really don't. because. They have these, these, these crazy ideas that, okay, well, if I let go of three reporters and I hire three salespeople, think of the money we're going to make. Hmm. Well, it doesn't work that way, as you know. You have to have content. And so, um, so I understood that, that it started with content when we started the Valley Breeze. I was a good photographer. Marshall was a good writer. We kind of knew what we wanted to put in. Um, and then we went to free. We went to free, and we also went to color, which was which a color paper. Just we could only afford to do it on the front page and four pages. But we we did tabloid, which was different tab style. We did color, uh, and and so we start. We just wanted to do different. And then free was unheard of. No one had ever heard of a free paper really in that market. And so um, you know we we worked very hard distributing those things the first few weeks. I mean I stood. I remember I stood stood in the Dunkin' Donuts line. Because you know you give your your order at the speaker and then you're stuck, and the and the guy Duncan was like, I, I was like, I'm gonna stand outside because I have a captive audience if you don't mind, and he was nice enough to say, sure, go ahead, don't bother anybody, <laughs> and uh, and so I stood in Duncan freezing in the month of March, you know, but but introducing the paper to hundreds of people, and and it it took off. I mean, people liked it. The, the other thing we did differently at the time, which has evolved over time was we really focused on the positive news. Um, the call in the Times, the ownership believed, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. That's what you do. And I remember just watching and seeing this negative news day in, day out about this, that, or the other thing, and thinking, imagine if you've just come to Cumberland and bought a $350,000 house, a $300,000 house back in the day. And every day you pick up a paper and it just tells you what a stupid decision you've made. How, 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 you know, because this community has that, 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 the policies, everyone's fighting this, 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 that, mayhem. And I thought, why don't we just focus on the really nice people there are in this town who are volunteering in schools or who are doing this and doing that, and, you know, because it was really cool stories. The second part that Marsha was really good at was, was we learned to not go to the town council meetings. And, and they, were, they were quite hurt, frankly. They were like, well, what do you mean? The call was there, the time was there. The journal was there at the time. And so what we would do is simply read those stories the next day, recognize, because we were all daily newspaper animals, recognize that they had to move on to the next story. And they couldn't dig in on the first story. And so Marsha would kind of take that all in and then start calling people and digging in. And we would have it um, a week later, or, so, or sometimes even two weeks later, a much deeper story about, here's what this means to you, Cumberland or Lincoln. And so. Um, 
you know, we were able to pull that off. Now, over time, when all those three people left town council, mm -hmm. we had to get back to doing that kind of work. Yeah, you, because you, you, you've always maintained, uh, you know, the feel-good part of this thing. But at the same time, you're now a staple for what's really happening, and and you're also uh, positioned editorially not only with your uh, editorial weekly with Arlene Violet and everything else. Um, taking a stand on things, uh, so well, so you've become substantial, and you've you've done a lot of risky stuff. You've taken you've taken on a lot of issues through your own editorial, with the risk of who you're going to anger out there, because the advertising dollars are very relationship based, right? No, nope. they are, mm. and and they, it's cost us a few bucks through the years, but not too many, I have to say. I mm. think people, even people who may not really agree with me on things, understand that. Like it or not, you put a stack that deep in the rack, and a day later it's gone, and so you know you know what's going on, and so you you may be a, in the political life or something, and you say, well, that so and so Tom Ward, but they have to deal with it. And and it's also cyclical. It right? is. It's very cyclical. Sure. Your, your your arch opposition or enemy, you know, in 2009 becomes your I ally that to in 2014, yeah, and, and then it rotates. Yeah, and you're and the worst is. person ever, and then you're not. And, no, you, you sound I, like you know something. I know about a little this. bit about that editorial <laughs> part. When we come back, we're, we're, we'll, we'll talk about the uh, the transaction itself, and of course, the state of the newspaper business. Stay with us. All right, there's a headline in the Providence Journal covering media: Valley Breeze newspaper sold to Virginia-based company. Um, I think it's soothing for people in the community who have an affinity for the newspaper to know that the transition, at least, will on paper be smooth, you're going to stick around for a year as the boss, mm -hmm. correct? Is that, well, is that open-ended or is that, is that, is that drop-dead date? Well, it, in, on paper it's a drop-dead date, but um, I've told them I'm not going anywhere um, at this point in my life, uh, you know, family reasons, I'm not going anywhere. And so um, I've told them that once we get beyond a year, again, call, ask anytime. I'll, I'll still. So tell them. me about this Whippet Media. Uh, mm -hmm. You told me on the radio that um, they had to say some of the right things in order for you uh, to have an interest in doing business with them and selling your your precious project to them. Uh, what did they say? What, what is it about the business that you thought was in line with your philosophy? Well, they they uh, they, rec they saw the paper and they recognized the value. They thought it was a good paper, as newspapers go. They've seen a lot of papers. They're they, out of town guys, but they know the area. Yeah, they're both basically the Boston guys. And Whippet Media. Yeah, he, the companies in Virginia. What dun, happened? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Whippet Good. Dun, 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 dun. Anyway, where does uh, Whippet come from? Rich Whippet, from his name. Okay, his name is it. Rich Whippet. There you go. Uh, Rich, uh, career wise, started in Boston Herald, and he's younger than me, and uh, found his way. Through Gatehouse, the big the big monolith Gatehouse found his way to the Washington D.C. area, and uh, was involved with the Washington Post, Jeff Bezos, the weekly papers around uh, Washington Post. Uh, my understanding is the, the Bezos said not really interested in the weeklies. Rich said I think I am, bought them out, and uh, and so Rich wound up by career in Virginia. Um, but I, I I know he's still got a soft spot for Boston and on all that. Uh, his associate, who was the guy who uh, reached out to me initially, is from Quincy. So they're Massachusetts guys, really, at heart. Um, I think they're looking, I, I, it's none of my business, but I think they're looking to buy some papers and they're asking around. And ours was a very well thought of paper and it was one of the first ones they asked. And, um, and I said, well, the timing's right, but are you right? You know, and, and um, it's funny, the first time I met Chris Eck, we're up in uh, Braintree at in, in a Starbucks, and, and uh, I got my coffee, and before I even sat down, uh, I knew they had worked for Gatehouse, and before I even sat down, I said, so what'd you learn at Gatehouse? And he said, how not to put out a paper, and I said, that's the right answer, and we can continue the conversation. What is it about the right way and the wrong way? Because it's, it's what I explained earlier, you, you keep cutting back, uh, and I don't, I'm not trying to be critical of Gatehouse. They've got their own way of doing things. They can do it their own way. But it is the Wall Street way that I think doesn't belong in newspapering. Um, and, and um, you know, just the whole constant cut, cut, cut of, of journalists um, uh, becomes a really difficult situation. I mean, the, 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 the journal, the Providence Journal, which they own, 
circulation has gone down pretty dramatically in the last five years for a host of reasons. Price goes up, all kinds of things. Um, but, but anyway, they, they, Rich and Chris, got away from that and said, we want to do something better. And so um, as Jamie and I conversed with them and said, what do you like, what don't you like, how do you want to do things? There was almost a sense that they felt they could learn from us. And, and so they said, we really, you know, you're running a, a very successful paper. Yes, we're buying it, but it's our intention to just leave things pretty much alone, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, nobody's, nobody's getting cut out or anything. I mean, I can't see five years down the road, but the thing about Whippin and Whippin Media is that, that they do digital better than I ever did. And, and you know, you've got to be in that game. I'm getting old. <laughs> I was never really yeah, you, excited you did, about that. You've done a pretty good job we, keeping up with the day-to-day. -day. So you put the paper out still weekly, but but day-to-day -day you can check the website, bellabreeze.com, sure. and see what happened yesterday or, or the day before. You can, but how do you make money? And it's all about money. Hmm. And and this is this the is the digital it. side is hard to monetize. It is, and it, and 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 I'm not, and and we've done it, but but these guys, uh, Rich and Chris and, and Whippet, have it totally different level on that stuff and that's what they intend to bring in which I really welcome I'm excited about it because I said these guys get this stuff and understand this and it's and it's really it's a good combination it's kind of the Achilles heel right of the of the media industry in general but specifically newspapers and even the major 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 national uh, and big city newspapers who originally gave away their content mm -hmm. in order to bring people to the digital side and then once they put paywalls up people said well I used to get it for free I don't want to pay for it anymore uh, it's not, they're, they're coming they're paying but they're paying now yeah yeah but there was a time oh, when things were not well and if, and if you really weren't putting premier content in there um, they weren't going to pay for the same yeah. stuff and then That's finding exactly a way right. to monetize it, every, you know, it, it I, the whole digital world is fascinating isn't it it's just yeah. everybody's on the phone but nobody's making any money doing it right 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 so if there's no if there's no currency if there's no economy there Investing in content is either a hobby or a losing business venture. Right. Right? Yes. Hard. Yes, it's very hard. And so my take has always been print first. That's that's who that's our bread. People and butter. still like to hold the paper. They I know do. I do. They do. Um, but I but I also know people in my own family who say, Your website is so robust and so good I don't pick up the paper anymore. And that says to me, to me, well, you're making a mistake, Tom. You got to figure something out. Well, do out. your three girls? I mean, and, and you're saying you, you get four kids. Do, do they read the newspaper? I've asked my daughter. I don't think my daughter, who's 24, I don't think she's ever picked up a newspaper other than, oh yeah, mom said there's an ad in here for a thing. Mm -hmm. You know? Yep. She's not reading it. It is right. all here. Yep. All of it. Yeah. I, I, are they, they going to come back to the newspapers yeah, once yeah. they're working for a living yeah. and it's laying on the well, coffee once table? They've, once, they've, once they've settled, yes. That's, that's what our, our uh, auditor tells us all the time. We know the ages of our readers. We, we make the phone calls. We do the surveys. We do all that kind of stuff. And, and what the typical, the typical take is that, that you're completely right. Your daughter, my daughters, well, my daughters are getting older now. They read the paper again. Mm -hmm. But once they settle into a community, once they get married, perhaps, settle, whatever, wherever they get, once they settle in, they pick up a paper again, especially if it's free. They may not buy a paper. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge more. Well, the millennials don't buy stuff. anything. Right. And so, and who can blame them with the student debt? But they, but they'll pick up the Valley Breeze. And, and we're in places where there are young audiences and the papers are being picked up. Um, but it's our evidence, uh, you know, I'll never forget one of my daughter's friends who had gone to Bryant University, um, had, had been to Cumberland High and Bryant University, and she was at my daughter's shower, and she says, I really liked your column this week. And I was just like, <coughs> excuse me, you know, she was about uh, 24 at the time. Uh, 25, but she had just gotten married six months earlier and had settled into Cumberland with her uh, husband. And I was like, you read my column or you read the paper? And she goes, oh, yeah. And I said, no, tell me why. And I knew the answer. I said, did you read it at Bryant? No. Did you read it when you were at Cumberland High? A little bit. So n why now? Well, because Cumberland's my hometown now, and I got married, and, and we're, we're living up here, and, you know, so now it's time. And, and that happens a lot. So I'm not worried. I'm not fearing this whole thing about this draining and all of uh, my readers are over the age of 60. That's simply not happening. Right. In general, we'll talk about where the newspaper business is going. Stay with us. Uh, and so there it is. Um,
Give me 60 seconds just on the newspaper business in general. Do you even have a perspective on the national, international business? You're so hyper-focused and you've done such an amazing job building a, a local business. Do you have a thought about where the big business is going? Everyone's going to have to find a way to get readers to pay for this. You alluded to earlier paywalls, and, and paywalls did fail at the outset. They're coming back now. And more and more, publishers are saying, you're either going to pay for it or you're not going to get it. This isn't a choice. Or, or, and, and they figured out how to have, um, just give them a little taste and a flavor and use a free website as a marketing site. But to say, if you want the deep dive and the quality stuff, you know, you're going to have to pay for it. Because I, I get 100% of my revenue from advertising. Even the Valley Breeze, if I was going to be around for the next 10 years, I would have to find a way to figure out how to get 10% of my revenue from readers, mm -hmm. or 20%. And these guys, these guys know how to do it. Quick thought on the Boston Globe jumping into the marketplace? I, yeah, I think it's going to be a bridge too far. I mean, good people doing it, but what do I think is going to happen over time? Not much. People no. have habits. People have real established habits. And to break those habits, Boston Globe is not homey. Boston Globe is not Rhode Island. End of story. Because of the brand or because of the content that they develop? The content's going to be great. They, you know, they've brought really good people on board. But because it says Boston, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So tell me, uh, have you pinched yourself? Except for the Bruins tonight. So, oh, yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a whole different story, right? Uh, have you pinched yourself over all this? Kind of. Yeah? Um, it, it was. It's a tremendous American story. Yeah. Newspaper man goes out on his own. Yeah makes paper out of his own kitchen, does good, builds business, quarter century later, gets bought out, lives happily ever after. I mean, congratulations on that, Thank right? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. you. Are you pinching yourself? Yeah, I, I think I've been blessed beyond, you know, you and I are both guys of faith, and I've said this for a long time. I, I've felt the hand, the, the grace of God uh, on this endeavor of mine, mm -hmm. and I felt it early, and I felt it through the years, there have been a lot of nervous time. I was a nervous Nelly anyway. It's it's my nature to not be cocky about any of this and to not to, to understand that, that maybe something will happen or maybe something will go wrong, and it never did. And as I told you on your radio show recently, you know, what you talk about the future newspapers, and I said, you know, people told me I was a dead duck ten years ago, and yet here we are. And so, um, you know. Uh, we have been ble I've been mostly blessed to find really good people to help the mission. And, and that's why it just keeps going on. And, and, so you know. 20 seconds. What, what did you learn? What did you learn over this? Boy, I can't do that in 20 seconds. Um, I, 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 learned, uh, I learned a lot about people and a lot about uh, you know, how tough it can be to run a business. And, and I guess my last comment to Rhode Island legislators would be, Please have a, have a gentle glove on us because um, people work extremely hard and in many cases the General Assembly is simply not being helpful. See, you still got the old editorial thing going well, and will for at least another year. Congratulations, my friend. Thank you very much. Way to go. Final word when we come back. So tomorrow night we'll, we'll try to catch up to this soap opera on the codification of Roe v. Wade. I'm still trying to figure out other than political agendas, what the urgency has been. But I'll tell you, there's a lot of gamesmanship for something that ain't urgent. We'll see you tomorrow, and of course on the radio at three until six on WPRL. Good night.